Okay, so it's, uh, oh, this is right in the corner of my screen. It says it's Sunday, September 25th at 2.02. Adam, you had some questions that you wanted to talk about this week. Um, oh, yeah, of course I do. I wrote and, down a list and I, it was and it's quite didn't long, it, did you? but uh, I could go over some of the things I thought we might talk about and cover maybe well, just a couple of them. Well, I see we got we got Tim H, we got Jeff, we got Stuart, we got Ingo. Ingo hasn't been with us for, oh. for a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I know Ingo's been working on his uh, working on his keyboard. Um, so yeah, I, go ahead. I was just looking at his site uh, just a couple of days, or maybe day before yesterday, seeing if there's any updates in there. There weren't. So, um, so as I said in the news group, I've been madly typing in or cataloging, indexing the many, 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 many newsletters that Jack uh, Boatwright sent me. Three boxes. Um, I forgot the number of individual issues it turned into, but um, it's something like 5,000 articles. Now there's, you know, there's some repeats because, um, you know, one newsletter would print something and then another newsletter would reprint it. But that's actually a pretty small number. Um, there's, there's a lot of sort of, I don't know, original stuff. I mean, there's a lot of user group meetings um, and, you uh, membership lists, which are kind of interesting. But then there's just a lot of little programs that people have written. And knowing Adam loves uh, programs with graphics, I have been especially typing in those as demonstrations. <laughs> so I thought I found this one um, that, how do I get back? There we go. That will print uh, the Mandelbrot set in low resolution. And this was by a guy named Roald Shack, who was in the Capital Area Timex Sinclair user group uh, out of DC. Um, and he used some user-defined graphics uh, to, uh, so this, is, this is all in, in black and white. Uh, he used user-defined graphics to give a sense of density, okay? So I'm gonna share this. So you can see the listing. Yeah, hit share. Okay, so here's here's our. Uh, nope, not load. <laughs> here's the, it's very short. It's in basic. Um, don't ask me what any of this stuff means because you know I I paid attention to the Mandelbrot set when it came out in the in the sort of popular press and Scientific American back in the eighties, late eighties, early nineties. Okay, um, like I remember there was a program printed in. The Atari newsletter in like 86 or 87 that did a Mandelbrot set. So. Yeah, yeah, there was a bunch of folks who, you know, wrote programs in basic or whatever so that you could plot it on your own computers, you know, at lower high resolution. This is low resolution. Um, and you can see the, the data statements here where he defines the characters. So when you run it, first thing, I, I'm going to put in numbers that I know work. Was it 0.02? Oh, oh. Okay. Okay. So now, because it's running at emulated speed, it's going to be super slow. You're not going to see anything happen. This takes hours to run at at real speed. Um, so I'm trying to remember how to get to. Uh, I think it's under CPU. Yes. Okay. Oh, there we go. It plotted the care. It plotted one spot. <laughs> All right. Well, David, I, I did notice before you moved it to uh, top speed yeah. that I said you were only running at 30% speed. No, that's, that 30% that, that I think is how much of the CPU it uses. Oh, okay. I don't know. I, 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 this is a little challenging with this, this emulator. Oh, did I put in the wrong number? But now you see it's actually plotting out. Let me stop it because I think it might be 0.26, not 0.26. Did it give you some example numbers to put in? Is that how you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, hello. Oh, because. <laughs> okay, I got to boost the speed back down. Fast typist. Right. Uh huh. <laughs> yes. Or change the repeat uh, uh, value. Okay. Um, that's not going to work, obviously. Yes. Understood, computer. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right, and I know the second number is zero. And now I will go to 
CPU. I th see, I think the 28 CPU, 28% means how much of the CPU that the computer it's running on. Okay, and now you can actually see it. Oh, I broke, I stopped the program. All right, anyway, it's amusing. I will send the code out. I'll send out the okay. tab file. Did you, you uh, let it run this. and then take some uh, screenshots? Yeah, thank you. I'll do that. Yeah, let's check that All out. Right. All right, so so Adam, you queue people up. <laughs> on, on the Mandelbrot front, I um, I originally saw it in Byte magazine in about the mid eighties. Yeah, um, and, um, and I keyed it into my my PCXT T at the time, and um, and it took twenty five hours to run with the for the base set, um, um, with whatever the resolution, and I did it again on an. AT with a mass copro and it was five hours. I then ran it on a three eight six years later and it was one and a half hours. And then I don't know, maybe late nineties, I ran it on a Pentium, hundred milliseconds. Oof! Oh wow! <laughs> and and probably on the iPhone, uh, it'll it'll you know or you know any modern phone, it would go really quick. Uh, it'd be real, real time. You could zoom in in real time now. It's um, yeah. You yeah. Could, you could, you could navigate around at 50 frames a second and, and oh that's pretty funny yeah there's a um a planetarium here in albuquerque that has um a uh a, a display they i think before covid they did it every friday night and they would have a um like um the mantle not just a mantle broad set but the fractal it was called fractal friday and they would have it displayed really large across the whole planetarium with music and everything and it was like two hours, I think, something like maybe an hour. And you go in there at like Friday night at like nine o'clock at night. And I think some people brought in their um, iced tea maybe or something like that in their little flask maybe. And uh, <laughs> and we watched the, the fractal Friday. I did it, I think twice. This was fun. But back in the late um, late 80s, a guy with a SGI silicon graphics machine was selling um, posters and guaranteed to get an original poster. Because he wow. just generated it with different coordinates, and so, um, and, and you know, the pattern never repeats. So, hey Tim, since we have you on camera, do you, do you want to tell us what you've been up to? I've been been playing around with the um, Windows to um, uh, to TS twenty forty printer. So, oh, that's um, right, that's right. And Stuart is here. So Stuart and I had this conversation ages and ages ago about about his stock of 2040 printers and he's you know he's asked me um if if there was there was some kind of you know software or if we could you know if there's anybody out there who who was using arduinos that would want to uh you know potentially use these things as, as printers and you did that <laughs> yeah so i um um and then of course willie good man you know i like chasing a rabbit and he gave me a rabbit to chase which is can i can i print from windows um and i got it um i had a problem issues with flow control it was dropping data but after like lots of fighting yesterday i, I managed to print using another pc as the uh, emulated printer and, and not lose any data so um that's that part of the puzzle solved and so and since i can print to the ts2040 um i just now now i've sort of got all the pieces i need so i'm printing from my PC, my PC thinks it's a serial printer using um, Escape P, the Epson um, <gasps> um, control codes, and um, and that's printing to another PC at the moment just through a serial back-to-back -back, um, serial ports. You know, nice transmit receive crossover, um, and um, and yeah, that renders fine. I'm just using a bit of Python to um, to sort of bash out the code. Um, so I just got to convert that to C and um, and figure out the smaller buffers and yeah, sure, I'll not too. I was hoping to do it for this, but I only just got it going yesterday. So so you'll be printing all your letters on the twenty forty from here on out, right? <laughs> so I've got reels of paper from the local <laughs> office supply. So and and you know continuous print meters of it. You don't no no page breaks for me. That's right. <laughs> Well, one of the things that I noticed, you know, in going through all these um, <clears throat> these newsletters, is that some folks would use the twenty forty and that natural, you know, width, and they would print out their, you know, their articles in, you know, the the, the width, and then I think they would shrink it down just a little bit in order to to make it uh, show up well on the page, and you you could just get two columns of of print, you know, without much difficulty. 
So you'll like be you ready if they Xerox it later. That, yeah, like, yeah, right. Okay. You assemble it into you know into pages and then like Xerox literally the cut thing. and paste. Literal cut and paste. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. I remember those days. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, what an experience that was. So I was wondering, do we have anyone that's new here today who's never uh, been on a meeting uh, before? I don't let's see. Think so. No. Doesn't Everybody's like... here, been here at least once. Yeah. Joe came back. We didn't scare him away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joe, can I ask you about um, about those experimenter cards and your your plans? Um. No. Okay. <laughs> I don't have any plans yet. <laughs> I'll get there. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> you can always ask. You can always ask. All right. Well, when you, you know, when you do figure something out, you know, this is, this is show and tell. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I, I did dig up something, my, uh, my abomination that uh, I said I was going to show you guys. Holy crap. That, that, that's a, that's my ZX81, my original one. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, this is the, this is, I should say, actually, it's my second one because the, the one that got zapped in the in the Hazeltine terminal, yeah. uh, that that one's in a drawer somewhere. Uh, but this was my second one, and uh, I actually took a uh, Timex Sinclair, or uh, I'm sorry, a Texas Instrument that was uh, struck by lightning. It was just toast inside, right? Yeah. And I cut it down and and mounted it in there and saved the keyboard, of course. Yeah. And you know, I have expansion slot out the side. But this is the one that I put a 64, uh, byte back 64 uh -huh. K module in so you can load the ROM into RAM and then modify it and then flip a switch and, and now you're running the, the ROM from RAM. Oh, so, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So you, wow, you did a really good job on, on the, the hack. Yeah, what did it, you it's, do? It's showing its age though. It's the, <laughs> the paint's beginning to craze. I don't know if you can see that in the camera, but. Oh yeah, yeah. slightly. But yeah, it's uh, but yeah, I just uh, I basically just cut it down and uh, uh, melted the plastic back together with acetone. Oh, very yeah. nice. So yeah. Wow, that looks fantastic. But you know, I, I do like the big keyboard. So yeah, yeah, and that was a popular. So is that the? I know that there were like two, maybe three versions of the the TI keyboard, right? There was the one. Right with like the metal frame and the, the circuit board. And then later on, they went to, um, I think it was Mitsumi that made a, a, a you know, I hesitate to call it, but a, but a Sinclair style with a, a, a plastic. Um, yeah, membrane. Membrane, thank you, yes. Yeah, the membrane ones, they, they're they hard to modify. But this is uh, actually yeah. uh, uh, individual key switches. Yeah. But, but these have a tendency to break uh, where the key cap goes into the key shaft and i actually had to uh recently 3d print a bunch of little these little things right here oh my gosh and uh slip them down over the top of the key cap or the the key shaft yeah right? and then glue it in place and it'll hold that and keep it from cracking and spreading otherwise the keys stick really bad a little stem reinforcer away. yeah so it just uh reinforces that and i've used these on uh oh a lot of other computers that basically have the same same issue oh that's cool yeah that's cool so you, you put all that stuff behind you you put it all to work put it to use <laughs> oh yeah yeah i mean i still pull this thing out and uh i've got the bite back relay board so i'll slam oh, nice. the relay board in the side and then i can control things it you know makes the grandkids laugh and it also looks like you've uh, done a uh, composite out mod on there is that right oh yeah 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 that was from years and years ago so yeah yeah wow yeah the the little one transistor composite mod yeah and was it good enough for the for lcds uh yeah it works fine on the lcd of course this has the uh the better uh, ula ula in it yeah okay uh, so it has an actual back porch okay uh, yeah very cool very cool awesome that looks fantastic Joe. yeah <laughs> i've got I've got a couple more that uh, that I've bought in over the years that uh, had manufactured keyboard or uh, cases and keyboards. Yeah, yeah, but uh, that that's the one that I slammed together. I don't know how long ago, probably late '80s. Yeah, yeah. 
mid mid, mid to late eighties. Stuart, do you still have any of those uh, plastic briefcases that Timex made? um yeah i have a few i have like i don't know six of them or something so uh, injection molded yeah i haven't been selling them because i didn't decide what i'm doing with them <laughs> well it, so joe's joe's um mod here reminded me that that some folks took that thing and cut it cut it out and stuck a keyboard in it and stuck their 1000 inside of it oh okay i've never seen that yeah and they would use the, the one i've seen was with the auric keyboard that was available at radio shack at a certain point in time with the red keys wait so the auric was a computer from like france right uh no it was english oh Auric? yeah okay yeah, well either way it wasn't us and you saw it at radio shack here in the states i i don't know yes i mean i, I remember the, i remember you know seeing the keyboards in the store you know and they have a little surplus section oh huh, yeah i remember um, i'd see the uh TI-99 there and the Atom keyboards as well. Yes, they were all there. I think early mid eighties mm -hmm. was when, you know, you, you'd come across those things. The Commodore, oh, and there were Commodore ones too at one point. Those were- I never saw the Commodore ones there. Uh, those were kind of, you know, not easy to work with. And the Atom I'd never tried, but um, I did use the, I did take apart one of those TI keyboards and turn it into a, a real keyboard for my 1000 at one point. It was maybe- yeah. 14. What, what? <laughs> the Commodore keyboards at Radio Shack, those those weren't for the, like the 64, weren't they for like a C16 or something like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. One of the yeah. less popular models. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I don't know if you guys remember the, seeing those with the, with the red keycaps, you know, um, Keith, who's not here, he took one of those and stuffed it in his 2068. <laughs> which required hacking into the the joystick port region because it was just a little too big <laughs> that's pretty cool hey jeff how, how are things in your world me yeah you're you're the only jeff today we oh only okay. one jeff. <laughs> i'm still uh dealing with the program or the project that will not die so i've had to uh put all of my timex stuff uh, all the software on hold. Um, yeah. I did find some alternate FPGAs though, and DigiKey actually has several thousand of them in stock. So it looks like I'm going to start doing going back to an FPGA based solution rather than CPLD. Okay. Okay. Now that's, is that a little more flexible or is it? Um, well, it'll give you the option of, uh, of having video on the output uh, mm -hmm. as well as uh, interfacing to an SD card and uh, also to a Wi-Fi if you want to. So, Okay. Wow. Wow. You might, you might just run, run the 2068 right on the FPG. <laughs> yeah, it's big enough to do that, but. <laughs> At that point, you almost are. Yeah. Cool. cool. I have I'm a question sorry. for Tim. Uh, Tim, you there? Yep, yep. Um, so you have your, uh, regarding your printer interface. So you have your 2068, is it you're working on? Or one uh, uh, ZX81? Uh, but both. Okay. And you're going out and creating a serial, something to serial? Um, I've got a, a this is a Arduino Mega. Okay. And. Um, and I've got a little shield that I made for it that comes out to the um, the the ZX eighty one pinout, which which is a you know there's a superset of that on the twenty sixty eight, okay. um, and um, and so this plugs into the 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 TS twenty forty or the ZX printer, both the same. Um, the only difference is the um, the ZX printer takes like um, nine volts, um, and the um, uh, that actually has to come off this comes off the edge connector and the twenty forty. Um, you have the external power supply, but mm -hmm. but they both work the same. I see. So you're coming off the the bus of a ZX81 or or whatever time or 2068, and you're talking to an Arduino. Yep. Uh, and um, um, now that in itself, uh, do you need a um, 
a latch between them or you've done it directly? No, just directly. There's no, no, um, this, this is just um, wiring. There's no, um, there's no electronic. There's a single resistor. And um, because when it starts up um, by default, it starts up with right, trying to write to it. Um, and it ends up with the motor wanting to run. So there's a single resistor that um, that pulls down the right while the while the Arduino's um, initializing. It takes a couple of seconds to initialize. And mm -hmm. so um, there's a single resistor there that stops it writing and hence the motor doesn't start. So you don't have paper feeding all the way through. But apart, that's the only component on here that, and, and this is a mega, but it doesn't need to be a mega. It could be, it could be the smaller Arduino, any of the Arduinos. It could be one of the little micros if you wanted. It's just this, because there's not that many pins for the printer. It, it only takes like 10 or 12 pins. Um, it's, this was designed to, to do the full bus, but um, yeah, right. I'll, do a, I'll do another board that, um, a shield that plugs into the regular Arduino and, um, and yeah, just one component, one resistor. Okay. Because... And then it's got a serial port, on, sorry, it's, your, it's got a serial port and that's where I'm hoping to feed onto Windows. So you can, um, you can use it as a serial printer on the Windows. Right. Um, because I've been thinking, um, I was looking through like the ins and outs book that describes the bus of the ZX81 and thinking, um, well, what do people play with now? They mostly play with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. And um, if people read this ins and outs book, wouldn't it be nice to provide some hardware for them to play with? that they could go to their favorite um, modern microcomputer like an Arduino. And I was thinking a shield for the simplest, like an Uno, that would go between the Timex bus and an Uno would let them play with anything the Uno does. So like, if it's got A to D, they would have A to D. If it has a D to A, depending, you know, if it, you have all the sensors for temperature or anything you want that that go on to the SPI buses or the different buses of the Arduino. So I was thinking that would be a good board to produce and maybe um, uh, do it as open source so people could just order the board or something like that. And you've you've already done that sort of is what you're saying, yeah. Um, would you have any interest in turning it into an open source project and I would pay to make some prototype boards and whatever? Because I think if it got modern hobbyists who might have one of those Timex computers somewhere in the attic or whatever, but they're actively playing with something modern, whether it's ESP32 or, or, or but Arduino is the simplest, it's the most robust in terms of hardest to burn out, I think, <laughs> and cheapest. And uh, and that would let people start to play with everything. And then if it were open source, people could uh, contribute um, different software projects so that like, if you wanna use the um, your Timex as a keyboard, tr almost transparently to your Arduino, um, you could, and then I guess more elaborately, if you had data flowing back and forth, you could have your Arduino print to the screen, essentially, you know, put out what the screen wants on the ZX81 or, or 2068. Um, I don't know if you'd be interested in, I haven't been building anything new. <laughs> I, I, the first time I loaded a tape into a ZX81 was about three weeks ago or something. And last time before that was in 1980s. You know, I essentially just been sitting on a lot of inventory and particularly when... Well, Stuart, may I ask, what was the program you loaded up? Three weeks ago, you said, I've got to use this. And it was? Um, I just picked a random tape. It was like... Um, I don't know, it's right over here. One of the Timex tapes, it was um, <laughs> like an investment planner. I'm going to get my investments. <laughs> it was some kind of financial planner software for, you know, from Timex. Um, I just wanted something to load and, and pick. And it wasn't the first tape recorder that I pulled, actually, that I was successful with. It was, I, I still think the most useful thing uh, after um, you know, straightening out your video and your keyboard, 
the most useful thing would be um, a little tape emulator or eventually somebody writing code to just turn your, um, your smartphone into uh, your tape recorder, you know, but I'm not, a, I don't, I don't know anything about coding for iPhones or um, Androids. But anyway, I'd be interested in having a board, you know, the, that, you know, would become like an open source project and everybody wants to feed their Arduino back into their, you know, and people could get into physical computing because that's a word we never used back in the eighties. But now if you talk to uh, third graders, <laughs> fifth graders or whatever they're in school and they have a makerspace or they're, be, you know, they're working with scratch or whatever they're working with, they use the term physical computing whenever your computer can get out to a simple little motor or uh, if it's reading, sensing things like a temperature sensor. So you could make a, um, a weather station for your ZX81 with just a couple of sensors. And I think, I think it might get a few people interest, re-interested in uh, pulling their old uh, Sinclair computers out um, if they could tack you know, something else into it. They do get a keyboard. They do get a, a display, <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, um, Go ahead. My, my intention is to, um, I mean, it's only eager that's stopping me publishing. I just want it to be look prettier. I mean, it's all, it's all just hacked together at the moment. Um, my intention is for everything to be open source. Um, so yeah, no, there's, um, and I've got a shield that for a mega, but it could be an, a, a, an Uno that, um, that pretends to be the ZX81 bus. And I've got one that acts like a peripheral. It plugs into the ZX81 bus. So it acts like a device. So um I mean, they're just straight. They're just straight wires. There's no no electronics on it, but they, but it's a shield that has that edge connector on it. Right. Um, well, also you've you've clearly figured out the timing for the printers. My interest when I talked to um, well, actually I had a dual interest with with the print. You know, twenty forty. Um, one one thing was what you did, which is having a PC be able to use your um, 2040. And I guess the Arduino could just use the 2040 once you figured all that out. Um, but I thought more interesting would be almost the reverse. Once you understand the signals that um, the printer needs exactly or is getting, which would be Put something like um, um, an, e, uh, an ESP3268 or whatever the number is there, something that has um, Wi Fi in it, okay, and could run a web server. And um, talk to it, uh, well, have it take, pay attention to the, um, 2040 printing that's being sent, and it would convert it to a web page. So you 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 could then you could have every browser, whether the browser is your phone, everything you have a browser on, a Mac, a PC, you connect to this by Wi-Fi to this ESP32, you know, uh, microcontroller, and um, it has a representation of everything that the printer is printing. So it becomes a virtual printer. And then you could do a, you know, you could print a page from your website and you'd have the what the printer would page uh, would print. And you have to have a slightly different mode, obviously, um, to do something continuously, you know, figure that out, how you would try to make it continuous. But so in that way, you don't have to have a 2040 printer. You could get it to any printer you have, you know. So, I, you know, which is it's it's in there. You have the hardware interface, really. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. anyway, if you'd like to knock some ideas around, but you've done all of, you've done the work. I've only begun. Uh, what I've been doing the last, uh, you know, I looked at Joe sitting there in front of his uh, workbench and his tools <laughs> behind it and all that, and I'm 
this summer, I, I have realized in my summer cottage, which is modest, um, that my life would have been very different if I had a suburban home with a garage or an attic or an extra room. <laughs> it was just for me, I've been working on going through kind of the dregs of uh, what I bought in the 1980s, which includes a whole a few dozen, at least, CX-81s. And I've been updating them with um, uh, tactile keyboards and, and video co convert, composite video. And um, for me, every time I do this in my apartment, I've got to like go to the closet to get <laughs> the soldering iron box and stuff like that out. And I have to take over a kitchen table, which is maybe four foot in diameter <laughs> or something, you know, and kick my wife out of the kitchen. And, um, and, and it's only a little bit better here in, well, it's better here when it's the weather is good and I use the outside porch, but it's, um, I realized that a lot of this didn't get done because I just don't have a workbench that's always out there with an oscilloscope and the soldering iron and the, and to do the work I'm doing a deep soldering pump is ab, you know absolute necessity because I've been pulling the reg, the the onboard RF modulators out and putting the adapters in there the video adapters in there and so um Actually, and then I've so been, store. while I'm at it, I've been putting 16K upgrades in them. So I have, and I have a box full of, um, you know, old ZX81s with uh, 16K RAM, tactile um, keyboards and video adapters. And it seems to me for somebody to really enjoy this, if I were to give this to somebody and say, here, really enjoy this, the number one thing that I'd like to give them is uh, a, a tape recorder emulator. Well, the tape recorder emulator isn't really needed because you can just save to a WAV file. Um, that's that's what I do. And then you can just play it back and uh, it's fine. Well, you're just using your PC yeah. or a computer yeah. and sound input and just yeah. doing that. Yeah, it's just, just, you know, it works fine. And so in fact, once you once you do that, you can, um, you have a good enough file to, uh, you can uh, run it through a converter program and then you can save it as a, as a tape TAP with the file extension. And then you can load it into an emulator too, or from the emulator you can save it as a tape and then convert it to a wave and load it on real hardware. So um, what would be neat would be to see something like um, uh, like some kind of uh, disk drive emulator, so yeah. that you could have like an interface and then you could have. Is that what you've got there, Joe? I think Joe's showing us. Is that the TZX Duino or something? Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, that is. I, I got this just a little bit ago. Uh, ba basically, it just uh, you can. Put your uh, oh, micro flash card. Yeah, uh, put your uh, tap files on a micro flash and oh, plug okay. it in, and it acts as a uh, tape recorder, oh. a tape player for player. all yeah. different kinds of. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is a player only, but it, it's for all different kinds of uh, uh, systems. Oh, yeah. so that's and, what Stuart's already asking about. So it yeah, already exists. Yeah, so this already exists, and then there's this. Uh, which I had ordered a long time ago, uh, but due to the shortage, chip shortage, it just couldn't be shipped. But this this one does tape recording and playback. What's uh, what is that, Joe? That's uh, uh, it doesn't even have a name on it. Uh, it's a mystery white box. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's uh, it comes from New Zealand. Okay. And uh, yeah, you can put a. Yeah, I uh, think. Uh... Um, I can't remember the guy's name. It's not Jan Beta, but it's another one of those guys. But he, I had mentioned this in some other earlier meeting that we had, but it's, it has a screen on it and it can play. Uh, it can actually take the, uh, you know, the remote out. So it knows when the computers wants the tape to yep. run. Right. And it can, and it, and it works for multiple systems right it's designed to work with amstrad and right you know tons of different systems not just the sinclair but but it's got the touchscreen interface so you can see what it's doing and uh god what's his name uh he does a lot of retro computing things but it's, uh, but he did a, a video on that <clears throat> that's where i saw it and i was looking at getting one but like you said at the time they were way back ordered because of the the chip the, the situation with the chips hmm. yeah i think it was no uh, 
It might have been no. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. I, but, I know he did a video on it. The reason that I wanted this so bad was it supported SVI, uh, the Spectre Video oh, SV wow, yeah. computers. And there was a small electronic shop, uh, electronics real uh, retailer here in Kansas that was basically going out of business. And he brought out several, uh, what is it, SV318s, and we're selling them for $100 a piece. So of course I grabbed they one. Were, they were new, a uh, brand new in the box. Wow, yeah, never, cool. never. Those never were touched. like, uh, in case anyone isn't aware, they're like an MSX machine, right? Yeah, yeah. Pre, yeah. I mean, they were they were what the MSX standard was kind of built upon. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're so kind they're of similar not in a lot of ways to the ColecoVision, but they're yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, but I did never had the uh, tape drive to go with it, uh, so I didn't have any way to really get software into it or out of it because it took a special tape drive, kind of like the Commodore. It has a funky connector. Um, it looks like that. So yeah, there was no way for me to load and save programs. And so I, I put my order in for that. And then by the time that I actually got this uh, device, it supported all different kinds of computers. So it actually actually came with a CD. That's <laughs> just uh, a whole CD full of you know 16k programs you know for all these different systems so yeah so joe i want to mention something i don't know uh, are you familiar with the television show from the 1980s called starcade it was like a video game show where people would play video games for top scores and such <laughs> like 83 or 84. yeah yeah i have yeah. a vague recollection of that yeah okay well at the end of every episode they would give away a computer which was the specter video and um if the one they would give away had a joystick built in on the side on the right yep. or left side that's, and I was that's... reading a couple of years ago, this uh, guy who won and he was in an interview because not that many people are even aware of the show, I guess. But he was like, yeah, I, I got this computer and then I couldn't find any software for it anywhere. So it was useless <laughs> to me. <laughs> but yeah, pretty cool little system. It looks kind of neat. Yeah, it, it is. I, I've actually had it out of the box once and I powered it up just to make sure it still worked. Mm -hmm. And then I put it back because I had no way to load software onto it. So yeah. uh, I finally got this not too long ago, and uh, yeah. does it have yeah. a cartridge port? Uh, yeah, it has or a uh, uh, SD Spectre card slot. video. Yeah, no, the Spectre video. I oh, think. the Spectre video has oh, yeah, a cartridge port. Sure, it does. Sorry. Yes, it does. Yeah. But uh, I haven't made any cartridges for it. Even yeah. even tried to figure out how to do that yet. Are, are you going? Are you thinking about the back bit, Adam? Uh, getting, well, getting, no. But you need to support the back it. Bit, do you mind if I transfer? Uh, talk about that for a second. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I've actually now used the back bit with three different systems. I've used it with my Astrocade, which I've mentioned. I've used it with my um, Atari 130XE. And then uh, about a week and a half ago, my buddy uh, came over and he uh, lent me his um, Odyssey uh, 2, the Magnavox uh, game console. And I uh, have used the back bit on there now. And um, it works with all of them. On the Odyssey 2, it's a little flaky. I mean, it works, but it's you have to modify the... Um, well, not modify, you have to connect the cartridge to the keyboard reset. And since it's not my system, I decided not to do that. And so I guess that you can't run any any programs from RAM with the CPU, supposedly. I'm, I mean, I don't really understand what's going on behind the scenes. So whenever it like runs out of, um, it doesn't have enough RAM in order to do everything it needs to do. So it will reset and some, all I know is I had to learn the hard way that I thought it was crashing all the time, but it wasn't crashing and it wasn't freezing. Like you just have to press reset when it's acting weird and then it acts normal again. And then and it automatically does this if you hook it up to the reset button and it's seamless to the user, but I, I didn't know that. But anyway, so I'm looking forward to uh, when it is released for the, um, when the adapter is released for the 2068 because it's a super, super handy device. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Hey, Tim, you mentioned that the Arduino takes a little bit of time to boot up. Do you know how much time that is? It, it, what, what it does is it listens for the bootloader. And so yeah. it's a couple of seconds, a second and a half, something like that. Um, it, there's, the bootloader sort of waits for it to see if it's being connected to the download code. And then it, so roughly a second. OK. Is there a way to bypass that so that it boots immediately? No, without 
overriding the bootloader. But then it's okay. not an Arduino after that. It's you have to do it through. There's an ISP um, header you can you can put code yeah. on it with it instead of the serial bootloader. Okay. Um, the, it used to be slower. There's a thing called OptiBoot, which is the fast bootloader. It used to be even longer than that. Um, okay. But the, all the existing ones run OptiBoot. Back in the what I can remember, Dua Miller though, whatever it's called, there's an earlier version pre you know um, that had a slower boot. Okay. Okay. So if you don't need the bootloader, if you're not going to like be reprogramming it, loading it, interfacing to your computer, the fundamental AT mega you know chipset comes right up. It does. Yeah. yeah. Instantaneous. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like 17 cycles or something. Yeah. At 16 megahertz, so almost instantaneous. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm have as a long term idea of hooking up using the Arduino to uh, take over the bus and um, hook, hook external things up to the, the 2068, but I want to, um, I want to do like the div MMC or div IDE devices do and, and come in first before the, before the, you know, the computer starts to boot its own ROMs. But, but you just hold reset all those devices. There's um, there's like a a, a switcher, ROM switcher for for um, um Commodore sixty fours. There's a few different devices that are, that are done on um Arduino uh, micros, Pro micros, and micros, and um all they do is hold reset. So um they start up, they hold reset up, and then when they're ready, they they let it out of reset. So that that gives them a chance to get in the right order. They they hold the um the micro that they're um, in control of and reset until they're ready. And then they oh. drop it out of reset, and so you can take as long as you like then, and oh. that way you're timed right. Um, the, the, so then they can sort of switch in the appropriate ROM, and then let reset go, and the and the device starts up. So, yeah, that's how they work anyway. Cool, thank you. That's perfect. Well, Tim, I have a question about that. Uh, like, are there alternate ROMs for the Commodore sixty four then? Like. Uh... Is that what you mean? Uh, maybe it wasn't the Commodore 64. Maybe it was one of the other Marcos. But yeah, it was a yeah. Marco oh, okay. that had a, it had a switch. I thought it was the Commodore 64. It probably is. And I was just, I don't know. Yeah, I haven't yeah. been in the Commodore scene in years and years and years and years. So, yeah. And they they hijacked the LED and put an RGB one in. So you, it's whatever color of whatever ROM it is. Um, and, oh, um, that's a great idea. And they idea. also make it so that um, one of the switches, uh, it, it, if you click it multiple times, it determines which ROM you come up into. Um, yeah. the, 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 the um, microcontroller is hooked into a switch so they can then, you can sort of pick your ROM. Is this the ultimate rec? <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it looks like Carl's not giving us our, his full attention. <laughs> well, I'm looking up the uh, where that oh, video the, the, is for the, the ultimate video. retro cassette replacement. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'll put that into the uh, chat. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, thank you, Carl. <laughs> and Stuart, the um, on the the um, downloading the the ZX Wespy, which is a or Vespy or however you say it in German, the um, uh, which is an ESP32. Uh, it it also does the downloading, but it's um, it downloads like downloads like a 26 byte um, a fast loader. And then that then loads uh, at a, like a higher rate because the normal normal ZX loading is like 38 characters per second, but if you know if it doesn't have to come from tape, it can be at the, at the speed of the processor. So um, so it sort of loads a, a, a sort of a four minute um, um, program in like you know tens of seconds. It's um, it, it's uh, it's super good, and it just plugs in a few wires. It plugs into the earplug on the on the ZX. Just a, just another option. Wow. It doesn't save though you can't save to it right you, you can save to it yeah it listens oh. on the save and the uh, earplug in the mic yeah it, it, it oh. earphone in the mic well and then so that's... you can save to it as well yeah that's so that's the... what, that is that the one from new zealand or that's the... no. no 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 i know what he's talking about I'll, I'll put the link in the chat yeah i can get one yeah. <laughs> whatever it is it sounds like oh it's I... neat it's really neat it's got a lot of other features maybe tim you can talk about it since you actually know something I, I've never run it. I just looked into it. You actually it. know it, something, um, Tim. <laughs> it, um, <laughs> it it, it uh, downloads its own little um, um, program that lets you then pick stuff off the internet. So it can, it's a, you know, because it's an ESP in there, so it can chat off to Wi-Fi. Um, and so, um, yeah, I've, I've only ever looked at it from the GitHub page, um, but it's quite cool.
Okay, I just put the link to the GitHub page in um, in the chat. And not only does it do the, well, so it's billed as, as you know, a video solution. That's its primary thing is that you can hook it up to one of those tiny little, uh, you know, LCD panels and display your, your video there. God, you have to use um, Yeah, the, the, well, the one, the, that one's the one that has its own LCD, uh, but if yeah. you go up, up a, oh, actually, I'll just paste it in. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a more minimal, <laughs> It's a more minimal version um, that that just does the ear and the and the mic and um, and, um, uh, and and lets you download firmware and stuff. It's it's not it, that was the bigger project, and this is yeah. a subset of it that does the fast loading. Um, it downloads a little menu system that then you can connect to the internet and you can pick programs to to download. It does the fast loading. Um, it, it's side by side with the with that IoT video. It's called IoT MI, but I, I think it's been dubbed Wespy ZX Wespy. Yeah. Or, or Vespi, however the, the German pronunciation is. Interesting. I hadn't seen that one yet. Cool. Yeah, I, I tried to build that one and I could never get it to work. <laughs> ah, but one of the gentlemen that was on here the other week, I've forgotten his name. He, um, he he's yeah. actually built it. The one that did the rainbow um, ZX. Oh, yeah, yeah, Kevin. Um, Kevin, I, that's the one. I thought he was talking about the implementation without video, though. Yes. Yeah, it's the, it's the, yeah. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the one without video, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I tried the one with video, but I could never get to work. And I, I'm thinking that it might be uh, originally built for a, a unit at a different frequency, like a 50 hertz unit or something like that it might be killing me. I'm not sure. Well, that's a good point. I wonder. I wonder if there's any requirement on that. I see he's got other things like a dual UART for the... A, He's labeled it as an RS-232 MIDI interface for the CX-81. <laughs> I don't know about MIDI. That would be a bit much. <laughs> um, I have a, a question for Stuart, actually. Um, so this sure. week, I uh, burned a, a ROM for the uh, Zebra OS 64. I guess it was, was it day before yesterday? And I was messing around with it. And I was asking um, anyone on the um, groups that I owe if they had a like sort of a history of it. And since you're here, you probably know some of the history of it. Uh, can you maybe give us a scoop? Um, I really know. I don't have a great memory. And um, uh, I know Jeff Street would have been the one who did the work. Um, but uh, uh, Al Hartman might remember, you know, if if you're if you're uh, if you posted it to that uh, Sinclair the Facebook uh, page or or got to Al through that, he would remember. He remembers everything uh, <laughs> how it came to be. Um, so I I I provided the the room. <laughs> That the people who worked in, but I didn't get very close to that project at all, really. Do you know uh, how popular it was? Um, I don't. I do not know how many we sold, but um, I would doubt that we sold. You know, fifty. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't think. So. Yeah. Um, I imagine part of that might be due because you had to like it's at least on my twenty sixty eight. It's not usable on even a, a composite um, good quality monitor. Like you have to have RGB, and it says so in the manual. It yeah. says you need to have RGB or um, a green screen monitor to to use it because yes, the yeah, sixty four column mode mm -hmm. is just it's just not readable on a composite monitor. I mean, it is, but not for long term use. Not without giving you a headache or something. Mm -hmm. Well. Yeah. Stuart, you must have sold one to somebody in upstate because back in the 90s, I went to a suburb of Rochester, New York to buy some guy's 2068 system. And he had he had the the your zebra, you know, floppy disk system with the yeah. the, the three, not the three thousand. Um, I, I do remember like, you know, when we sold them, we when we well, when we made the little cartridge, you know, board. Yeah. Um, I do remember getting a vacuum forming machine and we would get wow. black plastic and we would just kind of mold it over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
The vacuum forming machine turned out to be a very good way to make something super, you know, cheap uh, yeah. for pitching and, and at least give it a package, you know. Um, but um, yeah, I think that was probably my only contribution to that may have been, you know, back figuring out how to vacuum form a little cover for it or something. That's uh, awesome. Or finding the glue we used. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I guess I, I, yeah, I must have designed a PC board because nobody else did. I just don't remember. You know, I, I laid the PC boards out. Um, um, and I think, it, I, I think it was all manual. I, I don't, I, towards the end, I started playing with, I did have a, uh, some kind of computer layout, some CAD program, but basically I, jet, most boards I would just lay out um, uh, much bigger uh, than one to one. Yeah, uh, with tape and donuts, you know. Right. Uh, went back and back then we had and it would go out of my way to make every board single sided with just a few jumpers, which worked out pretty well. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't think we made any double. I don't, I don't remember what we did for double sided. I don't remember projects with double-sided play-through holes that I made then. Uh, uh, I don't know. So when you would make the boards, did you send them out to some place to have them? Yeah, made we were lucky. There was a place in Brooklyn. Oh, I wow. Go there. And not a huge place, but he, he uh, yeah, I had them made right in Brooklyn. And then he would dump his chemicals in the Kiwanis Canal. Uh, probably. <laughs> not far away from the Gowanus Canal. <laughs> yeah, a few blocks, less than ten. I don't know. I don't uh -huh. know exactly the path of the canal, but he was pretty damn close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you etch any, need to etch any boards now, I'll take them down to the Gowanus Canal. Yeah. Uh -huh. now, exactly. all, now it's getting very yuppy, and everybody's fighting over how to zone it. Um, <laughs> because there's more demand for people to turn it into residential than the existing residential people want. It's it's you know it's gone from commercial, dirty commercial, to um, um, artists. The usual prog progression, yep. Yep. you know, yep. Yep. Lots of spaces. The, the industry moves. The artists move in for cheap space and loft space, and then it's not cheap. And then it gets expensive and more expensive. And yeah. <laughs> Hey, Ingo, you there? I am. So what have you been up to, Ingo? Because we haven't seen you in uh, a few weeks. Yeah, or... I know. I I, uh, I definitely didn't want to miss this one because I've missed so many. I feel like <laughs> I've missed three or four meetings so far. Uh, I've been busy. Uh, so work has just slammed me. Uh, I have a customer doing integrations with a bunch of applications and it's it slammed me. Um, and then uh, I just got this last weekend or weekend before last, uh, I got a 3D printer for my birthday. Mm. And so I'm playing with the 3D printer. In fact, right now, as we speak, I'm printing a CX81 case. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just a test, right? Uh, because I want to build a bigger case. I want a case big enough to fit my keyboard. Um, so, and, and a few other things, but, uh, I can, I can probably share my screen and show you guys, I'm, I'm using Octoprint, which is a, a Raspberry Pi 3D printer server. Okay. It's a open source software that you can run on a Raspberry Pi and, uh, hang on, let me share my Octoprint. Were you here earlier when, uh, Joe showed his, um, keyboard enclosure for the wow for the uh so let me zoom in as far as it'll go holy crap so i actually have a little webcam hooked up to my uh, standing desk so i can look down on the uh the printer as it's printing and right now it's using white pla because the uh i got i got a roll of this cheapo pla from creality when i bought the printer and everybody says throw the stuff in the trash can but i've actually gotten some successful prints out of it uh, 
it's taken me a while though. I've had a lot of failures and uh, <laughs> learning learning the uh, chops. But right now it's printing the bottom cover of the ZX81 um, for the bottom shell. Yeah. And uh, just just wanted to see if I printed something bigger than a little, you know, Dungeons and Dragons miniature or a temperature tower. I uh, yesterday I finally finish, printed you know? a printed a. What's that? How long will it take to finish? So according to Octoprint, it's going to be 10 and a half hours oh just for that bottom half. It's printing really fine. I mean, it's it's using standard resolution, but uh, it's it's running this really tiny little bead and it's just going back and forth to stitching. I think it's on its like fourth or fifth layer right now just to make the bottom of the case. Um, I'm guessing once it gets up to the sides, the progress will move a lot faster. The cool thing is I've got the uh, webcam set up to do a time lapse. So it's actually recording a frame every so often so that when it's done, it'll have a video of this thing just rising from the build plate, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah. That's, it's all, been, that's been... also nice that you can, so if you're doing something else, you can kind of see, you know, if it's printing okay, you know, because a lot of times you'll go off to something and come back and it's just a stringy it's mess. Exactly, <laughs> that, you're exactly right. And that's happened a couple of times already. So I'll be downstairs in the living room, sitting on the couch with the wife watching a show and I'll have my iPad next to me. So I can like go in and check this view from the print mm -hmm. server. Cause it's, you know, it's just setting up a little, uh, a little web server on my local network. And uh, I can just sign into it and see you know, has the thing, you know, do I have like wild, crazy spaghetti all over the place or is it still printing something that looks like what I want it to be? And uh, uh, it's really cool though. I've been, I've been wanting one for about six years now and I've gotten to the point, I think with my electronics tinkering that it would be really handy to be able to make custom enclosures for certain things rather than having to buy stuff. And, uh, you know, cause like uh, I buy these, enclosures for different projects you know like you buy these little mm -hmm. project enclosures right and you put things in them and uh it'd be nice to not have to just be beholden to somebody else's idea of what the dimension should be right and be able to print prototypes of different things well not so, only that but those cost of plastic boxes is just insane anyway yeah is, yeah has it gone up Ingo, I would think that um, the standoffs in a ZX81 case uh, would be mechanically challenged by the screw that goes into, because I know even on the injection molded, you know, Sinclair cases, those screws put a lot of torque on those, um, those self-tapping screws put a lot of torque on those standoffs. Um, yeah. And uh, so I, I'd be curious if, if your PLA ends up, well, you know, actually it's, it's really hard to say. You might be better off because the PLA is softer than the actual uh, pretty firm plastic in the molded cases. But I'd be interested in how that works out. You know, yeah, me too. I'll, I'll let you know. But, you know, yesterday for the first time I printed what's called a temperature tower. Yeah. So... So what I did is I created a G code file that basically drops the temperature by five degrees centigrade every time it builds one of these little steps here, right? And so it starts at 225 degrees C and by the time it gets to the top, it stops at, uh, at 180. And I tried to break this thing apart. So like literally just grabbing this thing and trying to bust it apart and I, I, I can't, you know? So I, I was able to break off the part it was at 180. The 180 part didn't stand a chance. So up the top here, it just snapped right off. Uh, but all the layers below that are very stout. So um, plus, it's plus, uh, plus in your design, you might have. I'm sure you have like a hole there, right? You you 3D print to, so it so still has a hole for the screw to go into, thread yeah. into. Now and now I know and the, I know what's his name also did the uh, brass inserts too on his. Right? I was going to say yeah yeah. 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 So this this file, I didn't I didn't build the model. The model was available online for free. So there, mm -hmm. there was an STL file uh, that I downloaded. 
and all I did was run it through my slicer program, which basically takes that 3D model and says, okay, how many sausages do I need to squirt out and lay on top of each other to build this 3D shape, right? Uh, this volume. And uh, if, if, you, if you go online and just type in ZX81 case uh, model, you'll see it's posted in a bunch of different places. And uh, it's, it's a pretty decent representation, if not 100% accurate. The one thing that's a bummer that I realized after I started the print job is that the cutout for the RF modulator, you know, there, there's two possible positions, mm -hmm. either the front or the back. Well, <laughs> I, I'm printing the wrong one. But again, <laughs> I just wanted to see if I could do it and whether my printer would do it with the current settings and what it would look like. Uh, if it wouldn't require any kind of like filling and sanding and priming to get it to a nice outer finish. So you don't see those, you know, those separate uh, print lines. Um, but yeah, I if, so I don't know if anybody's ever tried uh, something that big, like on a resin printer. I think the resin printer would be pretty nice because you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get all yeah, those the layers. Much higher you know? resolution. Right. Yeah. In, in fact, you know, a lot of people that uh, paint, uh, miniature, miniature miniature figurines for gaming, you know, for Dungeons and Dragons and War Warhammer and all that stuff. That's that's like the holy grail, right? Those resin printers. Uh, I think most of them nowadays are like 4K resolution, and now they're coming out with an 8 8K resolution. So wow. you'd be able to get really really fine detail, which you hit a wall with these, uh, you know, filament printers. There's only so so tiny you can go. <laughs> On a practical sense, um, but you know, for printing enclosures and and other kinds of prototypes, I think it's it's perfect. So, yeah, it's it's funny you should say the about the miniatures and the three D the resin printers because I ordered uh, I ordered this this little space figure dude uh, printed at roughly I think he's this is twenty eight millimeter scale. Uh, it's about an inch tall or so, and the and the 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 detail on it is astounding, absolutely amazing. Is it like one of those space marines, or it's it's a pattern that, that some guy did. I don't know. If oh, it's there. It's really tiny. Wow. Yeah, he's like an inch tall. Oh and, wow. Yeah. And yeah, that's and what the resin printers are really good at because detail. they don't. Yeah. yeah. They don't are you going to paint it? Yet. I am going to paint it, but I'm I'm lazy and slow. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that, that's the kind of a thing that you should take your time with. You know, it should be should be something where you just kind of zone out on an evening after dinner and just, you know, paint a couple of layers, set it aside, pick up, pick it up again the next night or a couple of nights later, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Ingo, I have a quick question for you. Um, I'm looking at your background. Is that the Heath Kit 3400? Yes. It is an ET 3400. Wow. Uh, that's pretty darn cool. <laughs> I, uh, I, this was my first experience uh, writing any kind of machine code was oh, on nice. one of these. And uh, so I found one on eBay and knew I had to have it. So because I'm, I'm kind of building my own uh, microprocessor trainer using the Z80. And I wanted to see what this thing does and how it does it yeah. to kind of help me figure out how to do it with my own. Yeah, that, that, that kind of triggers my memory seeing that. Because when I went to TBI, uh, you know, it's our technical vocational institute here, you know, a community college, but I went there for my electronics, you know, after I got out of high school. And I remember doing stuff on something similar to that. I don't know if it was that one, but it's another, you know, we did all of our, you know, computer programming. Was it maybe the that. Micro Professor? Because there was another one, I think, that had a Z80 in it, and it was called the Micro Professor, and kind of a single board with a little hex keypad and some seven segment displays and leds on it yeah i think it might it might have actually been the heath you know and i've got a couple here too that uh i don't think it's that one but um i just remember because it had a breadboard on it and you could you know build uh you know logic circuits on it and and program your cpu on it but i i had to check my old my old uh school books because I, I have all that stuff yeah there's a there's a really neat user group for those uh and they're they're building all kinds of you know more modern day uh, expansions and uh, interfaces for it. And uh, you know 
getting different versions of basic to run on it things like that it's uh it's pretty cool <laughs> wait what are they using for an output device like for to display basic because it, it only has i don't even think it has an led display does it no no so you you, you uh you basically you you put a uart on it and then you connect a dummy terminal um, oh okay, okay. yeah Oh, oh I, I guess uh, you, could, you could just connect it to a dummy terminal. That that has a uh, 6800 CPU Motorola. So right. in case yep. anyone's That's wondering. correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I actually, yeah. the reason I'm, I was kind of excited to see it is because I kind of, um, like a few years, like, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago, I uh, I bought the manual for that because I was uh, messing around with programming for the 6800 for the APF uh, MP1000. <laughs> and um, so I was like, well, if I'm going to program for something, I want some proper material. And I also bought for like, I think five dollars, like the sixty-eight hundred manual from Motorola, and it's like this book. It's about this thick, mm -hmm. and it's, yeah. it's like yeah. it's got to be fourteen inches tall, and <laughs> it's, it's it teaches you how to make a uh, cashier system. It's from like nineteen seventy-six or something. Wow! It's like, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, so hey, you can go on. Oh, sorry, you can go on that front. Um, this is that that model you're printing. Oh, um, you, you just, printed one. Yeah, I just had some cheap blue <laughs> filaments, so. I even nice. put a bit of silver paint over the the writing, and um, and just a hint: the the top they it prints vertically. So get your right. first layer adhesion right on because the, the model has two. Up. Yeah, yeah, and so you got to um you got to get your first layer really nicely nice on because otherwise it just topples over. And that's what right. Kevin had it. He ended up with a pile of string. Um, but yeah, no, it um, and I printed this without any supports. Kevin actually printed some supports hanging down from the front of it, but this this managed to balance enough to print without supports the the vertical, the top, and there's a, you know, the the um, I put a bit of silver paint on the on the um on the nice. raised bits with the writing, you know. That turned out really <laughs> sweet. Yeah, I would think that the biggest problem or the most tricky part would be the uh the standoffs for the screws when you're printing it the vertical orientation but it it just stacks it out there huh yeah yeah the, the worst bit is there's a little step there's, sorry we're slightly stealing this there's, there's a little step down for the keyboard and that's quite a big span so on the inside it's worth maybe putting some supports because i ended up with a few strings that weren't attached um, right. Um, so, so yeah, may, maybe just on the in, in, inside, just bang a few. But no, the standoffs are great because they're on a slight angle and they manage to, they're not hovering out. So it can build and, out, right? You don't have too much of an overhang then. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, they were the easiest bit. It was that, that little bit at the top. And then quite did you Did you top. turn yours so that it was along the same axis of the uh, Y axis moving back and forth? 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was one of the yeah. things I read. I think it was in his notes, you know, saying, hey, if you're going to print this thing, don't print it so that you're going like this, but print it so you're going like this. Yeah, yeah. And, and since you've got a 3D printer, the next thing is what are you going to print? Um, if you're doing any retro stuff, there's a little springy in place thing that um, straightens the pins on on, on new dip chips. Mm -hmm. um, oh, cool. Um, I got to pull that one down. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah if and, you want to send me one of those. <laughs> I will. I've got. I printed. I printed a few off and give them to people. They're great. They, the, and the, yeah, the, the little, that's a great um, stocking spring. stuffer for us electronics geeks, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the um the um the, the the springs are actually made by the shape of the of the plastic on it. So um, and and one side's the um uh, the um the the small pitch mill. and the other side's yeah. the right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, that's that is really cool. Whoever thought of that, that's really it's on neat. Thingiverse. Yeah, it's on Thingiverse. There's nice. Yeah, I, those those things are impossible to find. You know, the, the original of those things are impossible to find now. I mean, I've I've gone looking for. I don't, David, I don't know what want, they're I'll called. I'll send you mine, dude. I have a, an original from like the eighties or whatever. Is it the kind that you, you did? You roll it through? Oh no, you don't roll it through. It's very similar to that thing. It's, oh okay. Yeah. So there was a style. Well, where... I got this. I got this from uh, Jamco. Is that is that squeezy or push it through? You got to squeeze them. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll go look at that. That's on Jamco. Hey, but yeah, Jamco has you know they you know you. Oh, we're and it's got that. a it's got a little screw on it, so you yeah. can attach you know uh, your anti-static, uh, whatever. But yeah, these what? I think it's like eight bucks or I don't know. <laughs> Who needs? Was there's there's no such thing as static. <laughs> you what? I've never used one of those. <laughs> I don't have carpet Is in my that... house either. <laughs> There is a pin straightener that uses screws and um, and, and springs on Thingiverse too, but this one's simple. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, um, 
Ben, uh, Ben um, from Bite Delight designed one. I, I think what it was, he, he 3D printed enough the parts for a design that uses um, um, uh, bearings, like like the bearings that go in your, your skateboard wheel or your, your uh, roller skate wheel. And, and you can just push the chip through and it straightens the pin as you, pins as you push it through. And I remember What's seeing- the advantage of that? Like, I don't, because uh, it works so simply, speed. the other kind of oh, speed as you- Yeah, because you just you just line it up. It's got these little um, um, shaped uh, entry points, kind of like uh, like Jersey barriers. So, you know, if you want to drive your car up on, on the Jersey barrier, you know, they usually know have that, that either. available for you. Um, <clears throat> So it's it's just like a it's it's ramped so that you can just push it right through and it straightens your pins, and that was the design I remember seeing in the eighties. Uh, I hadn't seen the hadn't seen the 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 squidgy one before. That's cool. Oh, that's the only one I know of. So yeah. okay, very cool, very cool. Well, that was back in the you know when they had all the wire wrap stuff too, right? There was some crazy yeah. wire wrap stuff. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tools for wire wrapping. It's nice guns. The best uh, wire wrap project I've ever, quote, project ever made, I think, is the, the Amiga custom chipsets. If you ever look at those, those were all originally wire wrapped. If you find pictures of them on the internet, like the, the, three custom chip, the Amiga custom chips, when they were designing them, they were all wire wrapped. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Which makes is absolute sense. crazy. I could, like to see them, they're like, they're board like many, many, many boards all mm. wire wrapped to make the process. Yeah. yeah, wire they're wrap so was cool. the that was the de facto back then. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm saying they're so cool, but I can't imagine having to troubleshoot with something when a transistor would go out or something. Like, how do you find your problem? You know. Yeah, well, I just remember a company called I think it was OK Industries, right? They dated a bunch of stuff. If you remember, yes, back to yes, OK, okay Industries, yeah. yeah, 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 they were the best for. You know the gun and and all the tools, all the wiring. Mm -hmm. That was them. Yeah, God, wow. So David, oh, I wanted to um, bring up something that you brought up just yesterday, I think. So oh. you're working on um, a project for the uh, uh, S, not S video. Sorry. Um, the 2068. Yes. Right. But the did the, uh, the RGB. I but... So huh? no, I, I gave him until six fifteen tonight. Okay. Okay. Six. <laughs> 20, but I figured... Okay. <laughs> there we go. So uh, instead of having digital, you're going to have analog. Uh, so, right. Okay. So inside the 2068 coming out of the SCLD, the video is a standard called YUV. Yeah. And I don't know what Y stands for. I used to know, is it luminance or something? Um, but the U and the V are. Um, one of them is red minus Y and the other one is blue minus Y. And um, this actually is, this is this, this circuit that I, I found kind of qualifies as an analog computer um, because it takes, um, it takes those, those three signals and does analog math on them to turn them back into red, green, and blue. Um, and my hope is that the noise that is so prevalent in the 2068 video is not um, a component of the blue or the red, and it's something else. And so, and if you feed, I'm hoping that if we, you know, if, if I put out a separate uh, uh, composite video that, that the Sega Genesis converter will take these signals and spit out the 15 colors without garbage on the screen. But that doesn't, that doesn't take um, that signal, does it? Uh, the Sega, Sega takes yeah. RGB. The Sega converter takes RGB, yep. Oh, huh, I'll have to. That's the one that I have that I use with your digital yeah. RGB. Yep, yeah. yeah. it's a, it's a, yeah. The Sega converter is a, it turns RGB of any variety, you know, analog or. Oh, or, I didn't. Or I digital. wasn't aware of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. so that would actually work with my Amiga then. Probably. If I made a, a cable for it. Probably. Because that would be freaking awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
not that I yeah. like Amigas, but you know, I don't, I don't see why not. You know, no. like, like if you made it, like as long as you made a, a, a cable for it, and the yeah. the diagram of the connector is well documented on the, you know, on the interwebs. Okay. So yeah, and so I, I drew it up in Easy EDA, which is, is this my, uh, you know, my idiot tool of choice, <clears throat> and um, um, Easy EDA. Some of the parts will have three D versions, and you find this out in the you know circuit board layout um, section when you hit the three D button. And so I, I worked backwards, you know, the, the resistors, they had 3D parts, the, um, the little op amp that I picked, which is a surface mount device, has, uh, has a 3D version. And it was really just the, the little nine pin um, Sega connector that I had to reverse map and an eight pin um, device for the uh, LM1881. But yeah. yeah and, and I think... And I think a lot of the noise that's on the video in the 2068, it, you know, I, I personally think it comes from the switching regulator in there. It so, does. you know, if you, yeah, if you get rid of that, I think, you know, you'll have a much cleaner video, you know, and that's kind of the whole premise of, you know, replacing that anyway, right? Yep. Just using the regular video. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. It does. I've done that in my, my main 2068 and I have less noise. Wait, would that fix my problem then that I'm having with the composite out? That I've been talking about over the last few days. It would is, significantly um, improve it. Yes, if Carl um, would take that little circuit board that he bought, and I also bought <laughs> yeah, of, I, I also bought ten of them. Uh, so I have a drawer full <laughs> that I've not used. But if if Carl would take that little circuit board and modify your twenty sixty eight to use it, um, that would probably improve your video quality. Because I'm like I was describing, I like my my video is quote fine when I look at it on a CRT. Uh -huh. but when I try to look at it on any other device that's like modern, it's yeah. like it's sometimes it's black and white, sometimes it doesn't sync. I have all sorts of problems. You have all yeah, exactly. It's a really noisy signal. It's got yeah. really weird hash in it. Yeah, it's, um, it's too bad too, because like I want to make some recordings of but I yeah. can't without well, I can if I point a camera directly or a phone directly at it and do it that way, but that's pretty primitive. And I want to directly capture the, the signal. Yeah. So uh, Claudius joined us and also I want to point out it's been an hour and 20 minutes that this program has been running. So I'm going to share real sc share the screen real quick to show you what uh, it's halfway, uh, two thirds of the way through output looks like. And so you can see how the you know, user defined graphics are sort of meant to indicate density, right? The little one dot versus the just the plain old space, and then these weird little you know dot patterns. <clears throat> Very neat. Yep, yeah. If you squint really hard, hey, <laughs> you can see the mail to prep set. <laughs> David. Yes. If it was running since the '80s, how far could it have gotten? <laughs> Imagine what we could have seen. <clears throat> Claudius, are the you original, there? Oh, before you jump to Claudius, the original Metalbrot yeah. set was actually done by a monk back in the, like the 1600s or something, and he hand calculated it. And when he saw the the shapes in there, it was some sort of message from God type thing. The the patterns in there. So Google the history of it. Really it's crazy. Yep. Yep. It's oh my crazy. God, that's so fascinating. Bit of spare time on his hands. Yeah, right. The monk certainly did. Oh my God. So. He... I mean, the math is kind of complex. And it's, a, it's just some additions and subtractions, but it's just that you have to do them tens of, well, millions of times, so. Yeah, yeah, it's right. So Carl, yes, I have the circuit boards for the TMS RGB as well, but it's, uh, it is so many surface, it's all surface mount, right? If I recall correctly? Yes. Yeah, and- Well, and I actually had, PCB way make me a template. So I have the steel yeah. uh, solder mass template, but it's yeah. just, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's going to take some time to build it. You got to solder mask it and put all the parts on there and then, and then reflow it. And 
But I did start getting all the parts for that, but that's a more complex version, I think, of what I saw you had. Yours looks like more, it's mostly analog. It is analog, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, it's uh, just a, uh, you know, PCB Whale actually uh, put the components on there for you, and uh, you just send them the file. They'll, they'll uh, put everything the on there, won't they? Yeah, they'll, they they'll can. They, they, yeah, that is another service that most of these guys are providing now. I mean, JLC, PCB, I think all of mm -hmm. those guys are doing that. Yeah. It just caught, you know, 3D dirt. print too. Yep. <laughs> yes. Just on that front, this this is an SMD thing. If you get a microscope, it's actually way quicker than through hole because you don't have to flip over, you don't have to click leads, you drop 10 resistors on just tick, 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 tick with a pair of tweezers. Once you get the hang of it, and I don't use a solder mask. I just use straight solder, straight onto it. And th these are um, um, 0603, which are not tiny, but they're not they're not giant. Um, no, it, once you get the hang of it, if as long as you've got the right equipment, microscope, tweezers, lots of flux. It's so uh, it's really way quicker than them through hole. You said you use regular solder, not not um, not that solder paste stuff in the. No, this is just just a normal bit of uh, 6040 or. Okay. 30, 38, 63 or whatever it is. The um, yeah, no, and um, and uh, yeah, I do down to 0.4 mil and 0603s, and um, it, you just need practice and um, and and good vision, and which I don't have at my age, so a microscope is the only solution. Right, I did right. So I bought a I bought a USB microscope for exa exactly that reason. <laughs> yeah, it's way quicker than through hole. Like I can bang one of these things together in a quarter, less than a quarter of the time, and because you don't have to flip, you don't have to. You're not Blue using a paste. Down. You're not no, using no, any no, kind no. of no, paste. Soldering by hand. No, you yeah, need just, a just... you need a really sharp tip soldering iron. And um, I've like Tim, I've done boards with 300 component surface mount components on it, and I can crank through one of those in three four hours. Really? I, I actually watched a YouTube video where a guy didn't even have a very sharp tipped soldering iron, but. There's a trick to if you drag across, if uh -huh. you sweep your your yeah. soldering iron across all the pins at just the right speed and use the microscope to make sure that there aren't any little globs anywhere, you can do it with almost any size soldering iron, right, Tim? So the trick there is that a fine tip soldering iron is worse for drag soldering because right. um, it, what it, it relies on surface tension. And so a, a wider like couple of mil tip. Um, has more surface tension than the pins. You don't have to do it, even the timing's fine. You can do it at any speed. It, it just, it pulls across due to surface tension. Um, so the finer tip ones is if you're doing one by one, which I do. And I also have a bigger tip one for when I'm doing the ICs to drag solder. And then a bit of um, braid, solder braid to lift off any bridges in case you happen to not be able to lift them off. So yeah, a wider tip is actually better for drag soldering. Yeah, the smaller tip, it, it ends up, the pin ends up winning and pulling the solder towards it and getting the glob. So yeah, exactly. And that practice, it seems scary at first. I've done dozens, like, like Jeff, I've done a heap of them now. And it's like, I just so much like it. It's so quick. Everything's well, I, on I can, side. Yeah, yeah, I could see on that board to be pretty, yeah, I could see it being fairly easy to do that because things are spread apart. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. fairly spread yeah. apart, but. I've like that stuff with, with, yeah, where they're really close. The, um, the, okay. the um, R R RGB to HDMI, the, um, there's only like a mil between some of the parts on that. And, yeah. Um, yeah, no, and, it can uh, be no. done, I guess. But I was just like, I just, yeah, since the template, well, the template wasn't cheap, but it wasn't really that expensive either. I think it was maybe $15 for them to make the, the solder mask template. And then I just, you know, you just got to uh, squeegee your, uh, paste on there and then i've got a little i went out and got one of those little mini mini pro they're little tiny uh what the hell you know it's a heating plate right yeah and uh so because the board will fit on there well, i don't think the whole board will fit on there but no, you know, most of it on yeah and you can kind of move it around but that's what i my my plan was when i was going to build these was to use that that's the whole reason i got that and <laughs> i've got, um, I've got yeah, I've got plates and I've got an oven. And now just after having all those, if you've got the, the, the stencil, great if you're doing more than one. Um, but if you're doing one, it's a bit fiddly. And, and so um, now I just soldering iron. It's just, it's just, yeah. easy. And, and you're getting a little bit of a rhythm, just lifting, pick and place onto the board. Um, yeah, it's, um, I've got all the other stuff because it seemed a bit scary at first, but yeah, it's fine. You don't. All right. Anyway, cool. I'll have to give it a go again. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Carl, I, I did, I did what, you know, I have, I think I have the same thing you have. It's about, it's, it's about, you know, 
little tiny square. Heater. Yeah, it's a mini play. I can't remember Mini Pro or the company yeah. that makes it, but it's a cute little thing. And it's got it's a great. OLED on it. Yeah, and it, it, and so uh, I put all my parts on, and they were all in place. And I I was doing what you said. You know, I, I was going to put the this is the oh, it's green. It won't show up. Okay. <laughs> 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 mine are mine are purple um, words. i was gonna do exactly what you said and as i was sliding it across i must have done something and i i hit the board with my finger and flipped it across the room and you know in midair the solder set up and the chips are like you know hanging off the board <laughs> i was like fuck this yeah, that's one of those things you need to just uh, you know make sure you have enough room for and 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 go slow. Yeah, yeah. I, I do plan on building one of those, or you know, I actually think I got five boards. You know, they you get five boards or six boards or whatever I got, but uh, and I think I got enough parts to do all of them. So it's just I, I just don't have the time. I haven't had the time to sit there and do all that. Most but that's another that's another point to that yuv converter right basically yeah you just want to that way we can preserve the bright and the and the non-bright mm -hmm. colors right mm -hmm. at least on the 2060 it's not a problem on the spectrum because they brought that pin out the bright yeah. pin comes out but um yeah yeah on the 2068 i don't know why they didn't <laughs> yeah they didn't do that <clears throat> I'm curious, who's using KiCad and who's using Eagle and who's more sophisticated than that? <laughs> what are you doing, David? I use uh, Easy EDA, which um, JLC PCB folks sponsor or something like that. And it's uh, it's all in the web browser. Okay. How about you, Carl? I use KiCad pretty much or KCAD, whatever it is. KiCad. Uh, yeah, KiCad. I use Circuit Studio from uh, Altium. Oh wow. wow! I used to use I used to use well I still have it, but Electronics <laughs> Workbench. I used to use Electronics Workbench uh, back in the day. That was a good program for schematic capture and and actually you can run the pro you can run the circuit too in, in Electronics Workbench. It's a simulator as well. Maybe that's all it is. I can't remember now. Gosh. I think I I, I've I, used that like when I was going to uh, TVI and uh, it was, well, back then it was just a simulator, but heck, it's been a long time. So yeah, I think they made, I think they made it so that you could make PCBs out of your, you know, schematic. You already have the schematic there. I mean, it's not that far of a leap to, to design a PCB from that. But, but anyway, I just remember all the ads back in the, you know, the, the 90s, right, for electronic workbench. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I have that still somewhere, but. Ingo, what do you use? Uh, I use uh, KiCad or KiCad, just like Carl said. I've, I, I've seen people or heard people call it one or the other, so I don't know which one's yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> KiCad. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you Cause, use? Yeah, because I bought some books from uh, Elector magazine, you know, because oh, they wow. have... Uh, um, I had for for KiCad five, and now of course they got KiCad six out right now. But and I think they're having a deal on the six books. You know, for fifty bucks, you get both of the books. I'm, I might actually have to do that. Great. Anyway, Tim, what what uh, what do you use? I, I was playing with KiCad, but um, mainly Easy EDA, just like yourself. Even the the big 25 chip ZX81 sort of replica that I've got um, it, it would be all SMBs all in, in easy EDA. Yeah, I mean, it's really pretty flexible. <laughs> and, and it's got an importer from KiCad, so you can sort of- Yeah, and, and, um, There's Eagle actually too. an exporter that'll, uh, that'll um, lift the, um, uh, yeah, both, both products. There's also an exporter that you can lift the components out of easy EDA and put them into KiCad in case oh, wow. you don't have footprints. It's, um, a little project that does that it's all in the in like json format so. mm. cool um, um i see claudius is here but his uh oh he says yeah i prefer if you have questions hey, claudius can you can you um turn on your mic and we'll pump questions at you there you are <laughs> hi everyone I'm Claudius. I'm in the UK, so it's evening, Sunday evening. 
I know you are in the just afternoon, wherever you are. Yeah, it's three thirty for us. Oh, well, not us. It's three thirty for me. <laughs> Depends upon where you are in the country. <laughs> I think for Adam, it's. Um, it is uh, one thirty. One thirty. That's right, because you have a two o'clock that you that so you go so, to. Well, not so today because we are a week off because uh, you are we were a week off with this meeting. So I had oh, that meeting last right, week. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Claudius and, is in the future. So how, how's the weather there? <laughs> <laughs> Tim's in the future it's too. It's a British weather, so it's not raining. It's fine, but it became <laughs> chilly a bit. Claudius, I, I, I'm drawing a blank on, on what it was that you did, but it was exciting. It was the video uh, face. Uh, oh, the video the, face. That's yeah. right. Right. Okay. Shame so, on you. Shame on you. So for so for folks who you know who have no idea what we're talking about. Um, there was a company called Romantic Robot that made accessories for the the ZX Spectrum. I don't know if they made um, accessories for the 81, um, but one of them was a, a video converter. You could, you know, plug it into your ZX Spectrum and plug your your VHS beta, you know, camera whatever into it and and do. I imagine slow scan screen grabs. Um, <clears throat> and the reason that it, Claudius, uh, Claudius has recreated this thing and the, the reason it caught my eye is because um, I had in, in scanning all these magazines had come across this similar project that, the, um, that some folks here in the United States had done. And I had seen at least one review of it from an American. So somebody had, you know, bought the video face, um, uh, you know, from from somebody from a supplier in England, which was something that that folks would do. They would, you know, once they figured out how to turn their twenty sixty eight into a spectrum, and once they figured out how to make a twister board, they started buying things like the interface one and micro drives, um, and some folks actually bought spectrums. Um, so I read at least one one review of this video face uh, product that Romantic Robot made and Claudius posted a few days ago on the Sinclair ZX World forum that he had recreated it. Yes, that's true. But the product is not a robot, robot, uh, Romantic Robot product, it's a Dutch product. It was created by Dataskeep uh, company. Oh, and oh. even if you use the software, if you use even an emulator, if you load the software, it's still saying Dataskeep LTD. Or, oh. So there is completely different. So the story is the Romantic Robot just bought the rights for the sale, and it was just uh, and they finally started selling them under their own name. So it's a video digitizer, so it can scan, quite slowly scan uh, the any composite video input. Uh, it was designed for the 50 hertz signals like PAL and SECAM, so it's not NTSC, what is 60 hertz. Oh, unless you are not in the South America when they have the strange, some strange uh, NTSC in 50 hertz, PAL in 60 hertz. Is that yeah. SECAM? Is that what that's called? No, no, there, there was uh, NTSC and PAL and in other frequencies. Yeah, they had N NTSC at 50 hertz. I mean, there's some weird formats out there, but they're pretty rare. So uh, why it uh, just got my eye? Because one of the friends on the Polish forum published that he would be interested to having the video uh, digitizer. <laughs> I started digging and I found the, the schematic what was published is published on the numbers of the pages. However, I couldn't find anywhere the, any hardware description. So typically, if you try to recreate something from the scratch and all the some schematics what are lying around, I'm pretty sure it doesn't work. So I did a PCB. Uh, so I redrew the schematic. I retraced the schematic, uh, double checked, made the PCB, ordered the PCBs in China. And when the PCBs arrived, uh, I soldered everything together, put it to my Timex uh, 2048, and it didn't work. 
So I put on the shell for nearly a week and started scratching my head what the hell is going on. Uh, did a good search on the internet and I found the description on the Hungarian page, but everything was in the Hungarian language. So Google Translator helped me to translate it and uh, understand how it works and probably what is going wrong there. And but it wasn't helpful much because I already did the whole address decoder uh, recalculated manually. I deassembled even partially the software to double check if the ports what I have on the boards are exactly what the software is using. Uh, and finally, I found some with good quality photographs of the original uh, video face using a graphic software overlaid the front and the back and trace the two counters are not wired how they should be so finally yes it's working it can digitize about three frames per second can save the last six, uh, six frames in the memory and make animation from the last six uh, capture frames and as well bear in mind is only kind of the single bit uh, digital to the analog to digital converter. This uh, interface doesn't have any ROM and internal memory and it buffers. It's just capturing how it's, uh, everything is on the fly. And later on, when you have the capture images, you can save them as a screens, as a six screens. Uh, the software can save on the tapes, on the micro drives, and as well on the floppy drives like Opus Discovery or Plus Free. You said it captures a, a screen in, in how much time? Uh, three, three frames, frames a second. Per second. Three frames a second. Wow. That's because capturing is about uh, 320 uh, millisecond, uh, yes, milliseconds. Wow, that's crazy. Use the shift register when I look at the schematic uh, Claudius. Uh, there is uh, HC 4094, 74HC 4094. There are two of those. And so is it capturing uh, uh, vertical or, or horizontal? Um, in terms uh, of horizontal captures, horizontal scan in the 16 columns. So the screen is the, because as you know, PAL is based on the two, two screens, every screen in uh, with the frequency of 50 Hertz. So in every 25 Hertz, you have effectively the screen shown. Right. It's odd and even. Right. So the one uh, shift register is counting the 16 columns it means every second column on the screen and later on there is another scan what is doing another 16 columns okay so it's like the two times it scans the, the 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 screen huh interesting because spectrum generated the uh, the image with the 50 hertz and as well you don't have like a two frames there in the, with the lower frequency it's just one fast Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, in, and we have two frames in <clears throat> North America. Uh, yes. Yeah. But with 60 hertz, so it's a slightly different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. Well, that's really cool. So, so you, and you got it to work as, as, um, as Adam pointed out, then you made a little video of it. <laughs> <That's> yeah. <right. laughs> and I found the, uh, Recently, another information, there was another video digitizer. This is Lumen, the first device for hacking your... Uh, which can scan 10 frames per second. That's really fast, actually. That's really cool. I'm, I'm trying to queue up the video, but of course, the ads. <laughs> mm -hmm. YouTube premium, Fuck. buddy. <laughs> However, the detail is about the second video digitizer for ZX Spectrum is lost. I found just a few photographs, very low quality. The software is available, but it's no description of the hardware at all. Hmm. I wonder how that one worked. That's really cool. 
I'm going to see if I can share this. Um, there we go. So, Claudius, what made you uh, delve into this project? Uh, as I mentioned, one of the friends of the Polish ZX Spectrum Forum mentioned about this video digitizer. The, there was something like that, so I never heard about. So I decided, why not to make it working? Where the data, all the details are available. Because I did a few weird projects for the weird stuff. I recreated at some point uh, Jupiter Ace from the scratch as well, from the uh, information lying around. I did as well a few interfaces for Jupiter Ace, like even is, the. Is the Jupiter Ace the computer that uses fourth as a language instead of basic? Yes. Oh, yes. well, that's crazy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> even I made the AY interface for those, which can play the music. Um, one of my friends made the uh, PT3 player. So you can play any PT3 files. I work for the while even on the SD interface for Jupyter Ace. I, have, I rec recreated or redesigned the Timex uh, computer 2048 uh, in my form. Uh, David knows about this. I yeah. was uh, dealing with uh, Mike Smith and he designed the uh, replica or even replacement for SCLD of the European version. And this video digitizer, what you can see on the screen is quite interesting. And now you can see I tuned the contrast a bit because there is a knob for the tuning the contrast. It means the threshold point. And uh, you can even move the window, which can be captured from the larger screen because the resolution is only 256 by 1992. Yeah. So that one is moved by a, a keyboard with keyboard to the standard five, six, seven, and eight keys. Interesting. It looks like you had the, the horizontal blank period on the left hand side yep. of the point. Okay. Well, and that's that really one fast. is the interface. What effectively you can do, you can start the, the capture or stop the capture to go to the menu about the saving or the create or show the, the animation of the last six uh, screens captured. That one was effectively the screen of my laptop when I play something from the YouTube. And of course, it worked much better on, a, on any cartoons instead of any normal uh, video. Because we have the sharp edges and as well the area with the, the same color were quite large. Yeah, high contrast. Yeah. That's astounding. That's just fascinating. No, that is just that is just pure um, uh, black and white, right? It's not grayscale in any way. No, is the uh, there is no grayscale because you can't because yeah. it's just a sampling. If you look on the uh, pulse signal on the oscilloscope, whatever is over the threshold is white, whatever is below the threshold is black, and okay. it's every pixel can be white or black, and you have like kind of shading very basic and raw shading really yeah wow. and, and claudia since i'm doing all things printers was it you asking for the 2040 printer schematic yes what you up to there <laughs> uh because i have one i have a couple of those and one was not working i just wanted to see how uh, the schematics is for this machine so i have the schematics for zx printer which are, to be honest, are rubbish a bit because the, the belt disintegrated over the years. And those uh, Timex 2040 and the Amplicon 32, they're quite robust and still working solid. Well, that's really fast. That's awesome. Yeah, unfor unfortunately, the 2040 has got the big, you know, the the big glue chip in there that pretty much does everything. <laughs> But the same as the ZX printer is Ferranti ULA inside. It's true, just a that's single true. chip. That's it. Oh, okay. But you know, yeah, I'm I'm with you on the Spectrum printer. It's it's much more mechanical of a device, right, than the than the 2040. The 2040, granted, yeah, it moves the head back and forth, but there's none of that, uh, you know, precarious springs that are scrap scraping across the paper. <laughs> <laughs> And Claudius, I replaced the belts on. I got two printers and replaced the belts on them, and they work, they work pretty well. They're, they're back to normal life, just with a 3D printed belt, which you can buy online. 
or you can print? Uh, yes, uh, recently they start being available on the Selmai Retro on the old S, but I remember someone recreated this belt three years ago and there was the issue with the printing. Because yes, these days the, the 3D printers are getting better and better. Yeah, yeah, I, I 3D printed it and it, um, it prints fine. Yeah, the, um, well, can you see it? There's right here. Yep. It, uh, it, looks, it looks like new. But to be honest, I don't know what is the condition of my free ZX printers. One definitely got the ULA dead. So that one can do just for the spare parts. The other two, they are as well not in the best condition. Yeah, you need to print in like TPU, which is like a rubbery material. But yeah. yeah. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Thank you, Claudius, for, You're welcome. for joining us. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to do a, a Adam and say we have about 10 ish minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> and ask if, if anybody has a preference about our next meeting. In theory, our next meeting is October the 3rd. That's the first um, Monday in October. Um, and that's eight days from today um I'm, I'm fine with it if if you guys are fine with it uh you know or, or well, we, we get can... a kind of a different crowd on the mondays than we do on the sunday meetings i think yeah so. yeah so we'll keep it there. okay and then the one after that the 16th of october i don't see any particular problem with that um by the way edgar edgar won his race but came in second for the season in points <laughs> <laughs> referencing last sunday <laughs> that was last sunday yes that was I, I had moved it for a reason and i forgot and yeah <laughs> but he did good it was it was a thrilling it was a thrilling race <laughs> um, uh, i, I want to ask a couple of questions maybe we can talk about these in the last meet in the next meeting okay. and I, was, I don't know if there's going to be anyone in this group will know about it but maybe there will be some people in the next meeting too. But basically, um, since I've been uh, burning some of the EPROMs and using David's EPROM cartridge, um, David had sort of uh, mentioned offhandedly that uh, maybe these can be, uh, uh, tapes can be converted to EP or to um, like a cartridge format that can be in a doc file for um, emulation mm -hmm. or, or the opposite way, like taking like, um, in particular, I, I burned Qbert, not that it makes a difference what ROM we're talking about, but, um, and that's an AK ROM, and I was wondering how that would be converted to run from tape. Like, so I'm not looking for an answer here; just maybe yeah. something to think about. Well, theoretically, um, I'd have to look at, at Qbert, you know, in particular to find out where it starts in memory. But um, uh, uh, Bank Four. Bank Four. Oh, well, but exactly where it starts. Oh, you know. you, yeah. Well, that, okay, then, it, then it's probably at a normal spot. Okay. Um, so is it a basic program or a no, basic machine, machine language? Well, okay. no, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, it was, a, it was supposed to have come out on cartridge. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's exactly an AK program, though. Yeah. Basic programs have to start at um, 16384. Five-ish. Well, I, here's a question. I get a little confused because it's bank four, but it's really zero, one, two, three, four. So in my mind, that's... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, four. Whatever 32K is, is that four, zero, one, two, three, four would be four. 32K. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. So if it starts in bank four, it might be in part basic. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It could very well be. Um, so anyway, just take off the header, right? I did. Well, the, it from the dot from, yeah. And, but then there's also the, the header that the EEPROM requires, which is eight ish, nine ish bytes off the top of oh. my head. And then you have um, you have just the program itself, and you could use the load code um, oh. uh, syntax to load it into memory. Um, but I have never done that, and I don't know if you're required to specify the address. Like but the I address said, David, would we be... don't have to figure this out during this meeting. It was like yeah. something to but think But in theory, about. I mean, yeah. that's that's because yeah. that's the process in reverse for making the, the EEPROM. You have to put the program in the right space 
um, you know, which usually involves some, you know, address manipulation and loading your program in, into that space. And then, you know, people were using their 2068s to burn them back in the day. Yeah, that must have been pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, there was a little cartridge you stuck in your, you know, the EEPROM burner stuck into your cartridge slot. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you'd run a program that would burn the thing and, and, write the little header and stuff like that it's, it i mean adam brings up a you know i've kind of been curious about this as well because you know i did you know i, I have talked to adam about the a ross and the l ross you know header yeah. bytes and all that kind of thing but you know you can have a basic slash machine language program right i mean that, yep. the a ross was designed for that so i mean if you had a basic program that you wanted to turn into a cartridge i mean that you certainly could do that but like i said there i don't think there's really a uh, 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 you know, a, a document that kind of explains that in detail, right? I know the technical manual kind of alludes to it, but they don't, yeah. they don't give any kind of examples. Because I mean, you have variables, right? Especially if it's a basic program, you have your basic variables um, that yeah, I think you have to preserve or, you know, something like that. And you the, have, you have to, uh, all your variables that you want to use, you have to define them when the program runs. Yeah, right. What I, but I mean, the, you know, the variables that are part of the time it you know the because the basic uses a lot of those right the you know what i'm talking about the system. not the variables in the pro, yeah system variables right oh, the system variables. The, oh, sorry yes yeah that are stored in the memory there and sometimes now you can't really preserve them because it's an eprom right that it's not a it's not a ram but <laughs> uh but i think there may be some values that you may need to pre-populate in there to tell it to run right or something but anyway I, but my point is there's no real detailed document and maybe that's something right. well, which I discovered, and which is why I'm bringing that up here. Right, right. So right, maybe, so, right. maybe that's something that yeah. we can kind of look at, maybe actually, you know, creating because I think a lot of people would like to maybe create their, you know, convert when he, their programs. When you're saying a lot, you mean you and me? Is that what you mean? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I know. I think a lot of people. Have, <laughs> I mean, I've heard it brought up before, you know, from other folks, but it's just, you know, it's in passing or something like that. I don't think it's a real serious concern, but, uh, you know, even machine language programs, you can do the same thing, right? That's how Timex did it, right? You got all these I just made an assumption because this is like a, a prototype, like for Qbert, I mean, it's a prototype cartridge. And I assume, because I also burned, um, like I said, the Zebra OS 64, which I assume mm -hmm. is not written in, there's no basic in that. That's I'm in guessing. machine language. Yeah. yeah, pure machine language. And that's a 16, I think that was a 16, 16. ROM. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I couldn't believe it worked the first time because I was having so much trouble, like getting stuff to work. And when I finally realized what I was doing wrong, I was like, oh, I'm so dumb, <laughs> but, you know, whatever. So, uh, oh, you know, what? I actually um, wanted to show this is the reason I wanted to play Qbert oh, wow. the, because I, I just finished reading this yesterday and this is called Creating Qbert. It's pretty cool. And uh, it's written by the guy who wrote uh, Qbert on the arcade. Mm -hmm. And um, he goes through about the half of the book is about that. Then he went on to make like a whole bunch of the back end software that was made to um, make the graphics and stuff for a game called um, Mortal Kombat. Duh. And uh, everyone's heard of that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but he was in the arcade industry for many, many years. And uh, anyway, it was the other, you know, kind of a it. kind of a segue to that is Warren David, you know, um, you know, New Egg, New Wave Toys. I think Adam, you got there. Yeah, not New Wave. New, new Wave. wave. Okay. Yeah, this is Warren. Yeah, Davis, New Wave yeah. Toys. Uh, but anyway, they worked with Warren to make the little six scale arcade machines. You have you have the dragons oh. there. You won that dragon. Yeah, there yeah, yeah. That I have that dragon that's layer. made that's made by New Wave Toys. And I actually have both of them. One's a Warren Davis edition, which is actually modeled after his machine that's in his house. Oh, oh wow. yeah, I, don't, I didn't even know. Yeah, that. He, I he's got his... a he's huh. got a, his own unique machine with different code that's in the uh, that he wrote for that particular machine. And so they made two editions, right? One's just the arcade Qbert, and uh, they made another one that was Warren Davis edition. They call oh, it. Oh yeah, his because machine. he uh, he had a ROM. Um, he thought it was when people were getting really high scores. He so he made one called Harder, Faster. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, but the, he added the cool thing. Features. The cool thing about if you were in the arcades back in the days playing Qbert, well, there was a, you know, like the pinball machines had a solenoid knocker, right? So when you won a game or something like that, it would just hit the wood cabinet, it, you know, kind of make a big noise. Well, Qbert had the same thing in it when Qbert would fall off, you know, ah, you know, he'd, he'd hit the ground, it would, it would knock on the cabinet as well. A lot of people oh, yeah. don't realize that. Uh, but they actually recreated that in the, in these little miniatures. 
I don't, there must be a solenoid in there because when he falls off, it, it's a physical, you know, knock, point. And wow. uh, so anyway, I don't know if he can still get those. You know, I, I pre-ordered mine year, you know, not years ago, but you know, they, they take about six months to nine months to actually, you know, get it to you. Right. Cause you pre-order it and then six to nine months later, you actually get it. Um, but uh, you know, I've got both of them and they're, you know, true. I, you know, true to the arcade, man. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's uh they did work with Warren Davis, like I said, you know, to, to create those machines as, as realistically, I guess, as they could. Well, right. that's uh, we have about three minutes left. Is there anyone who had some last minute business to take care of? David, did your metal brought finish or is it still going? Oh, oh, let me switch. Good uh, call. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Let me just pop that up for you. With the nine stop. <laughs> Uh, I can see it says on the bottom syntax error. Yeah. No. See, oh, stop statement. <laughs> it's got a stop statement. <laughs> so yeah. I guess it did finish. Okay. Isn't that crazy? Finished, but that doesn't look like the mantle brought to me at all. Like, well, it's a you know very small section. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to squint, Adam. Squint. <laughs> back, back, back up real far, Adam. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Let me back away. <laughs> Well, what yeah, do you expect it's... for two hours, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's awesome! Isn't that so thank crazy? you for typing that in, David. When you share it with the group, maybe I'll try checking it out too. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and the I, I put the URL in the um, in the REM statement, right? So you can go and read the article, and uh, you can you can see that he's got some suggestions. Like you, you could make a color, for instance. Uh, instead of instead of you know what he did with the there aren't many uh, twenty sixty eight basic programs that have uh, web pages linked in them in the REM sequence. <laughs> well <laughs> the ones that I type in yeah I try to put that into the into you know the REM so that you can find it later <laughs> Ryan said that the uh, the physical knock was his favorite feature of Qbert oh yeah yeah that's the only yeah. arcade because I used to work in an arcade you know. I used to repair them and, you know, convert oh them and all that kind of stuff back in those days. And I just remember that feature. That was the only arcade machine that I ever saw that actually had a, you know, like a pinball knocker in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the book, uh, Warren talks about how, um, like, that feature was in there, but it was supposed to, like, hit it, not hit wood. It was supposed to hit, like, foam padding, but they decided to save money and not put the foam padding. So it was really way louder than it was ever meant to be. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So, That's cool. And so for that reason most arcade operators there was a dip switch you could turn it off and so mm -hmm. they would just turn it off um, i was thinking i was uh, because i never experienced that i mean you know in the arcade that i went to i don't remember that happening but that was yeah they probably had it turned off or something like that or maybe people freaked out when the you know he fell off and the machine <laughs> made a noise you know <laughs> very cool well gentlemen as as always it's been it's been a pleasure um We'll see you in eight days. Sure. Sounds great. Okay, Thank you cool. for keeping this up. This is really, really fun. I have a great time uh, with these. Yeah, yeah, see me too. Guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Claudius, for joining us. Have a good one, guys. Bye. Bye.